Okay. So, thank you for uh, allowing me to, or letting me fill this extra space you have. Um, you can see the title. I don't need to go into that uh, too much. Um, I've been to Antarctica three times. Uh, the last time was 2006, 2007 to work on these things. And let's give you a better, <laughs> okay. There, let's get rid of the title so you can see these things better. Um, they, um, these things are what we're studying, polygonal patterned ground. These ones are young, and these ones are more older and more developed. And we'll go into that in more detail. But what's really cool is that the ones on Mars look exactly the same. And when the, the Phoenix lander, we've lost some of the caption there. There we go. Um, so when I and my students and uh, all of us involved in this project saw these pictures, we went, wow, look at that. And all of our housemates went, uh, okay. <laughs> so um, now let me see if I can get this to work. Ah, okay. Now this talk I'm giving you is actually based on a talk that my student gave at a conference on ground penetrating radar, um, but I've embellished it for this audience. Um, there's the group of us. So um, the uh, my master's student, uh, Mavanwi Godfrey, uh, did her master's. Last I heard, she was superintendent of mines in Queensland. Uh, that's me, of course. Uh, John Lapwood did his honors dissertation with me the year before and then came along as a field assistant uh, before he went off to work in the mines in Western Australia. And then this is Michelle Bannister, who did her honors project that year in geology and astronomy on the dry valleys as an analog for Mars. And some of you may be aware of her and the work she's doing. She did her PhD at ANU looking for exoplanets, and she's now a research associate at Queen's University Belfast. And you will have seen her name in the news, looking for planet X out beyond Pluto, and also that enigmatic object out there that seems to be orbiting the wrong way. So she's been doing work on that. Um, so it's kind of exciting to have seen all of where all of my students have ended up. Uh, this just some K054 is the designation for the project, and that's a unique designator. And if ever I get the chance to, if I ever someone is willing to take my eye teeth and send me back to Antarctica, that will be the number we use. Um, this is just a list of what we're going to do. Okay, so in other words, I'm going to give you the, the introduction, why we did it, how we did it, what we found, and what we can conclude, the usual sort of strategy. And the, what we're looking at is permafrost. And so basically, it's the zone here of permanent, fro being, the ground being permanently frozen. So there's an active layer up here that goes frozen in winter, thawed in summer, and there's especially a thin layer in here of water that is particularly forms and dissolves ions in the ground, and that will become important. So what happens is we initially, the young ones, you get this, it freezes, and of course ice expands, and you get the cracks opening up, and various material falls in, and then the crack can't close, so it opens further. And so these cracks grow with time. So you get the, by the 500th freeze thaw, you've got quite a big crack. And you notice that because the ice can't fill, it deforms. And so you get this wonderful deformation in the cracks and in the subsurface and in the active layer. And so these were our targets using the geophysical, um, the non-invasive, non-destructive near-surface geophysical imaging. So that was the whole idea of the project, was to use these geophysical methods, that's what I am, I'm a geophysicist, to look at this, and we also wanted to see if we could see anything in the course of even just one thaw, because how long these dry valleys have been ice-free is controversial. So that's where we're working. Um, you know that most maps uh, north is up. Well, this isn't one of those maps. Um, north is up everywhere. Okay, so there's the South Pole. So there's north, there's north, there's north, there's north, there's north. 
Um, okay, so here's McMurrow Sound um, and the Ross Sea is, uh, so McMurrow Sound is right in here. Ross um, Island is in there. New Zealand's down there somewhere. Uh, Chile and Argentina, South America is there. Uh, South Africa is over there somewhere. Australia is over here somewhere. And so that's where we're working. And so here's, um, get to find the button again. So there's Ross Island and trans Antarctic Mountains. And so these areas in here are where we have the dry valleys. Now, Antarctica is 98% ice covered, but 95% of the ice-free area is right in here. And it's been ice-free for a long time. I'm not quite sure how long, and, there's, and as I say, there's some controversy. So one of the sites we went to was Victoria Valley here, and then Beacon Valley here. So I'll show you each of them in turn. So here's Victoria Valley. And uh, so that's sort of the views from Victoria Valley. You'll see, I'll show you some more of these later. And so we leave Scott Base. So here's Scott Base, uh, Mount Erebus, active volcano in, uh, in Antarctica. Um, often we'd see there, and there appeared to be cloud there, but actually it was steam uh, and ash. Um, the tacky flag, the t-shirt I'm wearing, that's the Scott Base Bar, at least that was the name, and it's basically at this corner, I think it's this corner right here, it might be this corner right here, um, having a nice view out across uh, Ross Sea. And we take off from the helicopter pad with all of our stuff. We fly out across the Ross Ice Shelf and into the Transantarctic Mountains. It's a spectacular view. Um, this is me, my view from the uh, front seat. Being the team leader, I said, I claim that front seat uh, beside the pilot. Um, the scenery is spectacular. It's one of the, Antarctica is amazingly fragile environmentally, but also phenomenally harsh. If you make a mistake in Antarctica, you could be dead. So it's both harsh and unforgiving and yet very fragile. And we finally get into the dry valleys, and you know it's hard to tell one dry valley from another unless you know the lakes and the and the glaciers and so on. So here we are back at our site, and notice the polygons are everywhere. Okay. So this is characteristic of polar regions, especially you know Antarctica. We see them in the Arctic. We see them in high alpine areas. Anywhere you have permafrost, you get the polygonal pattern to ground. And let's move on. We again. So the, we unload, we set up. Um, yeah, when, the coming down on coming down on the plane with the Air National Guard. One of the guys, um, you know, these are part timers. You know, they they go out periodically with them. He had his own real estate agency. The sign was up in the plane. I said, uh, "Would you like us to uh, put this up at our camp?" He says, "Yeah," and then send me a picture. So, um, but this was our our. Home tent, so this is where we would eat, relax, and so on. Um, so here's our camp. Relatively con contained, um, not spread out, a small footprint. In fact, the NSF people came out to look at our operation. Um, we became the model of the operation, largely due to Mavanwi's organizational skills. So um, these are our tents here and our home tent, and that's another view of it. That's a bit distorted. It's actually, the distance here is a little bit further. I think I use a telephoto lens, and so uh, that previous shot looking out across the valley was taken from up here. Um, this was the view up the valley towards this the Victoria Glacier and the Antarctic ice shelf up here flowing down. This is the view out my tent in the morning. Um, out one view and out the other. Um, as I said, it's you know harshly beautiful. Um, it's there are people, pe two kinds of people go to Antarctica. Those who go once say, oh, "Okay, I've done that." Actually, there are three kinds. There are those uh, I don't want to go. Those who go once and say, "I've done that," and then there are those of us who go and it gets in the blood, and we go again and again and again. 
Um, so we hiked up to that glacier. It's about two hours. We took one day and just took a day off and hiked up there. And that's 50 to 100 meters tall. Yeah, it's, we, you don't go very close because the ice front is always collapsing. You don't want to have any kinds of injuries. So again, that's the view. This is looking, there's our camp right there. Let's zoom in on that. So looking out across the valley. So there's our camp. And so we placed it and we then did all of our experience right close by. So there's the camp, and so there are polygons. That's the young polygons. Those are the young polygons. That's the older polygon. So these, the, this isn't very far, you know, tens of meters in each direction. And then um, Michelle did a big transect across the entire valley using uh, deep imaging techniques. And there's Mavanwi standing uh, by polygon set one. Uh, we didn't. We we took um, the sets um, in here. Uh, these four here. We didn't go to this one because that's Sammy the seal there. Um, yeah, he wasn't in terribly good condition when we saw him. Um, he, you know, various animals get into like penguins, seals. They get in there, and there's no food. There's no water really, um, and they die. And because of the setting, they just become mummified. Um, we did have creature comforts, you know, I, there I am with my, the lawn chair, my coffee in the morning. Um, we had Christmas down there, and it was a dry camp, not in terms of alcohol. <laughs> yeah. Water was only for drinking. We had a case of that horrible alcohol-based stuff that you use for the disinfectant that... That's all we had for washing. <clears throat> so we had lot. We had beer. We had wine, and so on. Anyway, the storms come in occasionally. Here are the clouds spilling over from the Antarctic uh, shelf, and here's the clouds coming out from the Ross Ice Shelf, uh, from Ross Sea. And of course, those days you don't go out because if you get too far from camp, you might not be able to find your way back. Um, and here I am, uh, wandering up the hill, uh, and one of these storms is starting to roll in. I took a picture and I went back to camp. But you can see it, it did get cold, unlike the picture where I was having my coffee. There were days when we worked in t-shirts. Uh, this was not one of those days. Okay, the other one, Beacon Valley. Um, down here. So Victoria Valley, we thought, you know, it's been ice free for say hundreds of a hundred thousand years, maybe, maybe a bit more. Some people think that uh, Beacon Valley has been ice free for millions of years. Maybe a million years, but some people think eight million years because they date the rocks on the surface. And they get eight million years. But when you see our results, when you see our results, um, it sort of brings that into question because we can see active processes underneath, which suggests that that may not be the case. So we, when we, this is a trip we took to scout out um, the next site from Victoria Valley to Beacon Valley, going across the Transantarctic Mountains. Again, spectacular scenery. You can see though. The low cloud level, which is, um, you know, that meant that weather was coming in, so we ha didn't have very long. But again, spectacular scenery, uh, spectacular exposures. Um, and here's Beacon Valley, the first view of Beacon Valley. And we can see, again, from the air especially, we see the polygons everywhere. And these ones are rather better developed. Um, so it's very rocky, but here again, you can see the clouds moving in. So we only had maybe a couple of hours there and we had to get out. Otherwise we were going to be trapped there. Okay. So what we did was we looked at a whole different set, poly, number of polygon sets. So we <coughs> classified them into four different kinds. Low relief, so that was polygon set one. We didn't even bother measuring the topography. 
You know, it's, it's the sort of thing you can barely measure. You know, here's the typical surface here. You can see there, there's the area there, and here's the trace of the polygons. So it's very low relief. That was the first set of polygons. That was the ones uh, near the camp, polygon set one. Then this was near the camp in Victoria Valley, polygon set two. Moderate to low relief, you know, about half a meter. This is sort of typical surface. And this is the classic shape. So it's got, here's the cracks that are infilled. Here's a ridge that builds up because of the deformation of ice adjacent to those cracks. And you have a central hollow. Then Beacon Valley, the first one, that's moderate to high relief. So upwards of half a meter to a meter. You can see it's, you know, rather deeper cracks the higher ridge, and then this central hollow is a bit smaller, but it's always there. And then finally, uh, Beacon Valley 2, high relief, 1 to 2 meters. Here's, here they're trying to do the radar survey, um, stepping up. And you can see it's a little more difficult, a little more challenging. Now, I wasn't here in Beacon Valley. I'd managed to do my knee in Victoria Valley. So when we changed camps, they took me out with the rubbish. <laughs> um, so my students, though, being very well organized, um, they were able to carry on without me and actually and do a very good job. So we did a whole number of things. So we did um, radar imaging, um, 100 and 200 megahertz. I'll talk about that in a minute. And line spacing, very tight line spacing so everything overlapped. We got nice 3D images. We got uh, surveys that gave us the velocities, and we did time-lapse surveys in, in Victoria Valley, and I'll show you that in a moment. Um, so here's an example of the surveying. Uh, we always all took turns moving the antennas, uh, took turns look, monitoring the laptop. So what we do is we send out a signal, and so we have this antenna, it sends out a shaped pulse, some of it travels through the air, that's the fastest. Some of it travels through the ground. And so the air wave provides a time reference, the ground wave provides a depth reference. So some of the, most of the, ener the, the energy travels mostly into the ground. We get reflections from the boundaries and from anomalies. And those reflections then return to the receiver and we record it on our laptop. And this is another way of looking at it. So here's our air wave at 300 meters per microsecond. The direct wave, about 100 to 100, 150 meters per microsecond. And then we have reflective boundaries below, which will have different velocities, depending on the content. And so we've got a wiggle trace. So we've got this pulse we send out, and we get the air wave as our time reference, the ground wave as the depth reference, and then any reflections from the subsurface that tell us what's there. Um, now, what's interesting is that there's this wonderful relationship between velocity and wavelength and frequency. Velocity equals wavelength times frequency. That's true for all waves. And so the wavelength is the velocity divided by the frequency, and the resolution at the surface is one quarter wavelength. It increases, that, that increases with depth. As you get deeper, it's, the signal spreads. The, that footprint of the radar spreads out. But basically, it's about a quarter wavelength, and that governs our step size at the size of the survey. So here, that resolution is about 32, 16 centimeters, so 15 to 30 centimeters lateral resolution. So that's about our step size. That's, that would be the optimum step size, and we did less than that. 20 centimeters for the 100 megahertz, 10 centimeters for the 200 megahertz. And the vertical resolution is about a half to a third of that. So that's the kind of scale of things we're looking at. And then, ah, okay, so that, that does show up. You can, this is, I've tried to up the contrast. You can see instant gratification as we're going along, stepping along, we actually see this, the record showing up as it develops. We can step the antennas out from a central point. It's called center, center midpoint. And we can figure out the velocity of the subsurface, we also calibrate to make sure that we get the airway velocity, and it always works out so far. And so we were getting velocity of about 120 to 140 meters per microsecond. That 
number is wrong, that, that should actually say uh, 0.12 to 0.14 meters per nanosecond. Um, so we do, then we've got these, all these profiles, massive number of profiles. So we do batch processing, we throw it into the computer, we do our topographic migrations, merge out all together, and then we apply what are called H AGC and SEC gains. AGC means automatic gain control. And the gain, the amplification we apply, is inversely proportional to the strength of the signal, which means the deeper it goes, the smaller the signal, we boost it more. So it's great to look to see what we can see. It gives us everything. So here's an example from the, from the flat ones, from the polygon one, we see all of these things. And in particular, we can see the cracks. And we can see, here's the active layer, here are these different uh, beds in here that are, are slightly deformed. But notice the cracks aren't vertical. And we went, oh, that doesn't fit the model, which is actually often what happens. Nature often does things like that to us. Um, and then we did the same, here's the, here's the second one. And one thing I want to point out, so again, these cracks aren't quite vertical. Uh, but notice this, and there's not much below it, whereas over here there is, but here there's this very strong reflector here. We think that's buried mass of ice. Remnants of the last time Victoria Valley was glaciated. And I want to go back and do 3D imaging of that little bit and core it and find out how old it is. Anyone got a spare? couple of hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> okay, Beacon Valley, same, same sort of thing. Now we think that there might be buried mass of ice in Beacon Valley, but when, um, we need to do more analysis. And some of the analysis I've been doing suggests, now here, the cracks are more vertical, which is interesting. Um, and here's this one with the steep topography. And again, the cracks, well, they're not quite vertical, but they're not dipping very much. Um, and it gets quite deep. Now, we thought that there might be buried mass of ice in Beacon Valley, but in fact, when I go back and look at it and do more detailed analysis, it looks like it actually might be isolated pockets of ice in the near surface, not deep. Okay, so we can see the subsurface structure, we can see deformation, we can see the cracks, uh, we can see, we think we see buried mass of ice and the relic surfaces. What we can't resolve is the, the crack depth and whether the crack morphology is consistent with depth. Oh, it looks, you know, it looks pretty close. So how about the time lapse? Well, you want to be able to compare from one to the next, including changes in amplitude. So what we do with the SEC, that's spreading an exponential compensation. All it does is compensate for the geometrical spread of the signal. It's like a blowing up a balloon. The balloon blows up like this. And so the signal spreads out one over R squared. And so it, it does that. And so we can compensate for that. And also the signal can be attenuated, scattered. So we lose energy there. So we compensate for that. So that means the strength of the reflectors remains the same and consistent. So we start off and every, about every four days, we did this. So here's, um, First one, you can see here's the crack. There might be might extend it out a bit more, but this this is definitely highly attenuated in here. And we see these different reflectors in here, and we can see them again. But the crack, you know, it looks as if um, that zone of attenuation is expanding a bit. But these cracks, you know, they uh, they don't look exactly the same. They start to change a little bit. Notice here with this zone of attenuation looks a bit different again. And so we did about every three to four days. And we didn't expect to see much change because it's just one thaw. And yet we actually see some significant changes just over the space of a few weeks. And if we're seeing changes in that short a time frame, what does that say about 
the ages of the dry valleys and how long they've been dry. Because the assumption was that if you date the stuff on the surface, that represents how long things have been going on, how long things have been ice-free. But if the deformation has been going on for a long time, hmm, it makes you wonder about that timing. In fact, the people who did the dating actually scraped away some of the material and dated the ice underneath. And they got 8 million years in Beacon Valley for the stuff on top and 100,000 years for the ice underneath. And they somehow argued away that the ice was an anomalous response, when in fact it's probably armoring that doesn't move when the ice deforms. It just sits there. So we've got then deformation over even, we see slight, slight changes even just over one short period. Now part of that might be due to the changes in the active layer, with that thin layer of water dissolving ions, which tends to scatter or attenuate the radar signal a bit more than otherwise. So we see reduction in our signal response. We see the attenuation changing. And we also see these changes in the cracks. Okay, so you can see there are subtle changes in here in the morphology of these reflectors. Now, they're subtle. Now, how much of that's due to the change in the active layer and how much of that's actual due to deformation? Um, the deeper you go, the less influence that active layer has. So I think it looks real. So we can see the active layer and it's some changes there. Uh, we can see seasonal activity. Uh, we can see the re possibly release and movement of salts, the active depth layer. Um, the expansion and contraction of cracks um, that's a little harder to pick because of that uh, changes in the attenuation. So one of the things we realized was that it's better to do these radar surveys early in the season because then you get better signal, less attenuation. Um, we need to do a more in the way of signal analysis, and this is something that I'm, I'm continuing to work on. Um, I'm, I don't think that the Beacon Valley is over a buried mass of ice body. Uh, we question this 8.1 million... Um, your surface. There are two schools of thought, of course. There's Marchand and his group, and then there's the people I work with and we think differently. Um, the active versus uh, the relict processes, things that were recording past activities. Can we re directly relate the morphology to the age of maturity? Maybe. Basically, those, the cracks are forming by sublimation, although we did see some melt during the summer season. Uh, but in particular, that one that I talked about, that uh, strong reflector, was right over top of this thing. And this is a very, very resistive body, which is indicative of unperturbed, massive ice. So that's buried massive ice. <sighs> Let's get out. I'm going to do 3D imaging. My core. Let's do it. Anyway. Uh, sort of like some of the archaeological work I've done. You know, oh, look, we found something. I dig it. No. Um, so, we, um, a lot of this we're doing is because Antarctica is a global barometer. Um, we can look at the coupling of the dry valleys and the processes and the climatic conditions. Uh, we can monitor the seasonal changes. And so we wanted to do a long-term seasonal monitoring, but uh, the New Zealand government decided that it was more important to invest money in the in research into southern fisheries, because that made money. Um, then into looking at paleoclimate and paleo um, um, glacial processes in Antarctica. Um, and of course, we come back to Mars and the fact that um, the PPG overprint on Mars. I mean, this stuff looks exactly like the stuff we saw in Antarctica. And that's, that's exciting. And so a lot of people have thought the same thing. And so in 2020, there will be a launch and there will be a, another Mars lander. And this time, it will have ground penetrating radar on. And I've been going to the GPR meetings now for a long time. 
the ground penetrating radar meetings. I've been going to them for a long time, and there have been lunar radars and Martian radars, and these have all been going on for a long time. And now it's finally going to happen. And so here's a schematic of what it will look like, something like this with the radar here, and this is what the subsurface would look like, and this is what the radar image might show. And they've been doing some tests. So here we've got our, our prototypes, of what they call the wisdom antenna. So they've got two, a couple of different kinds of antennas. Uh, this one was from the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in 2009. So this is where the two groups you know, overlap. So here they've been doing some tests on Svalbard. Notice the date. I went looking to see what they've been doing, and hey, they're testing it just last month, just a few weeks ago. 20, and uh, it's kind of exciting because look at this. Now that's ice. That's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 meters. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a good response. Someone in the audience went, damn. Okay. <laughs> and then there's the, there's the, the rock below. Now, that's not necessarily a good test because we're not going to actually see, well, we might see the CO2 ice, but when we're off in the, per the permafrost ground in Mars, that's not what we're going to see. It's going to be more like this, but even then, 8 meters. So that's pretty good. Um, and it's for um, this site right in here. So you can see the sediment, the buried ice with internal layering, and the moraine. So, very exciting to see what's going to happen. And, uh, yeah, so any questions? Thank you for listening. Oh, um, okay. The average polygon would range from about half the size of half of this room to this, okay? So if I'm looking here, I would have from here back to the back and from that middle section to halfway through here, that would be the typical size of one polygon. But I also saw polygons that were double that size. Would that be age-dependent? <clears throat> no. no? The, the lateral dimension is not age-dependent. The depth of the crack and the height of the, depth of the ridge, that's age-dependent. So the older they are, because the ice, what the ice does is sublimates. And so you, and you tend to sublimate preferentially from where the crack is forming. Oh, yeah. Why polygonal? Why not square or triangular? Or triangular? Well, some of them are hexagonal, some of them are quadrilateral, some, I mean. Uh, are common angles or no? Well, no, it, it, that's just it. Uh, people have excavated some of them, but from our radar, it looks like it, the cracks could go in all kinds of different directions. I suspect the ones on the young polygons that we saw that were dipping may be due because, to the fact that they were at the base of a slope, and so the subsurface might be like a rock glacier flowing and carrying, deforming that, so it was actually taking some of those cracks and transporting them down slope a little bit. But that's just a hypothesis for which I have, you know, could the fluid in Mars be anything but water, causing the polygons there? Oh, it's probably CO two. The, the, it's the, probably the, the frozen carbon dioxide, because that's what the poles are. That's what the polar ice caps are. It's, it's frozen CO two. Well, would it have the appropriate viscosity to cause that? Because you seem to say they're comparable size, and comparable shape. Um, I think it's just the freeze thaw process and the fact that you get these cracks uh, then forming because of the, free, the freeze-thaw and the sublimation, so you get the material falling in. Once the crack forms, once the crack forms, then it just keep, continues growing in there. And so it's, a, it just, it's like um, with faults. Once you find a weakness in a rock, the fault keeps rupturing in much the same place. It doesn't, form, it doesn't crack in a different place the next time. It always cracks in much the same place. There's another... So the robots on Mars are those. Uh, ah, and, then, and just in the in the polar regions, just been south or just uh, equatorward from the um, from the polar regions. So there's, I guess, subpolar. So roughly around 
same latitude as where the previous lander was? That was Phoenix, yeah. That was the Phoenix lander, yeah. Yeah. Can you get any data from satellites? Do they connect to anything? Oh, that's where, where some of the Martian uh, information has come, actually, is from, sa is from satellites. And that's where we know that it's CO2 at the, the poles. Oh, yeah, there's some from that, but not for the polygons. It's, it's, it, it's, um, they're too small scale. So, yes? You mentioned there was alpine polygons as well. Yes. Are, are they consistent with the same structure? <clears throat> well... It depends on the climate. Um, the ones that are in humid climates are going to be like the Arctic polygons. You see, the Arctic is actually more of a humid uh, polar climate. Antarctica is a dry polar climate. So it turns out that the mechanisms for the polygons in the Arctic and the Antarctic are different. And so it will be the same for the, the high alpine polygons, depending on whether the humid setting, where you get water percolating in and then freezing and making the crack, or in Antarctica, where the, the cracks form because of the ice, uh, re, you know, the water refreezing in the active layer, and then it, they cracks and the material falls in. Um, so they form, have slightly different mechanisms, but we see them you know, de, it, de, on, in, the, in the alpine areas, and it depends whether it's a humid or dry climate, the mechanisms for their formation. But they, they follow the same processes. Someone in the back? Oh, oh, yeah. You, you mentioned, okay, it's permafrost areas, and you notice this in. So in warmer areas, then is that's where you find linear or parallel lines or a star shape where the water is more surface and flowing? Well, that's just it. You see, if you don't have, if you don't have permafrost, you're not going to have these kinds of formations. Um, I mean, if you think about it here, we, where we, we get the freeze-thaw, but we don't see polygons, because this is temperate. Um, Going back to the earlier question, then, why are they closed polygons as opposed to open? Uh, I'm going to have to pass on that, because I don't know the engineering dynamics of the formation of the polygons. Now, people have worked on that and tried to explain that, but nature likes these kinds of patterns. You see it in all kinds of things forming again and again and again, that the stresses involved, you end up seeing these kinds of shapes showing up in nature, and it's just the way the stresses get distributed. It seems to be the most efficient and effective way of distributing the stresses and taking them up. <laughs> With your subsurface uh, scaps, how deep are you actually going in those two valleys? Uh, with the results that you showed. Oh, okay. Um, let me see if I can go back. Um, so, in this case, with this, we're getting, uh, with the high frequency, we're getting um, the scale here. Um, See, that's 5, 10, 15, 20. So here we're, we're getting about 15 to 20 meters. Uh, but when we did the transect, we used 50 megahertz, and we were easily getting 20 to 30 meters penetration, which is quite exciting, really. You, know, you can really see some, some cool stuff. Do you have any idea how deep it goes? Ah. No, but we, we did some other techniques called um, a transient electromagnetics, and that can get down 100 meters. And we saw a brine layer, a very salt-rich layer at depth. And people have observed this sort of thing with drill holes near the lakes. The lakes have fresh water floating on top, and underneath it's salt water. So they get hypersaline. So you basically freeze the ice, the salt out. Yeah. So what can we tell about Mars, based on your study, other than that there is a freeze fossil? Um, it needs more work, and they're going to send another lander with radar. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, that's the thing. There's always something new to find out. So, for example, the work we did with this 
you know, it was the sort of thing where we saw this deformation, so no more work needs to be done, but we also saw that. And we went, wow, let's go back. And everyone said, no, we're not going to give you the money. So, so. <laughs> mm, yeah, it's a, no, it's, it's, it's exciting. And one of the people who was working on this with us, um, Ron Sletton, was involved with the Curiosity um, Lander as well. So that's the nice thing. You see, he's being, he works in Greenland, Antarctica, and Mars. <laughs> and by the way, um, do any of the kids have any questions? Okay, that's because I had a slide all prepared for somebody to ask. Um, how do we go to the toilet? <laughs> <laughs> See, I was all prepared because any time I've given this question, given this talk before, um, <laughs> at night in our tents we have pee bottles, and they're very carefully labeled to distinguish them from the water bottles. Um, and then this is our throne room. Um, notice that the wind break that's been put up, um, and it's well away from the camp. And so there's a little bit of privacy as well. It's, this is not. This is both a privacy shelter and a wind break. Um, but uh, yeah, you. It is quick. You don't want to expose uh, too much for too long. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually. There were days it was up around 10 Celsius, you know, because it's 24 hours sunlight. But there are also days I uh, that it got down to minus 10. Yeah. So when, when exactly was this? Uh, this was uh, December, January 2006, 2007. Ah, uh, so summer. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Oh, you don't go to Ant people winter over in Antarctica, but they do not venture very far from the camps. No, no. You said that Antarctica is fragile, so what did you do with the waste? Whatever we took in, we took out. And so when I was medevaced, I got taken out with the waste. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so when the waste removed, like, you know, when you guys leave? Yeah, when we, we, when we leave, everything goes. Including all the waste? All everything, the waste. everything. The only thing that's left behind are our footprints, which can last years. Eventually, they get wiped out by the wind, but they can last years. So we always walk the same path every day to get to the site to minimize the footprint of the damage. Um, whatever water we brought in was for drinking, and then we had pee bottles for what was left over. Um, John Lapwood... Um, Actually, after a while, we started rationing his tea. Yes, you can take the rest of it that's for yourselves and, and extrapolate that. Um, but yeah, it's, and as I say, I'd do it again in a minute. Oh, yes. What's on the left of a typical trip? Oh, there isn't. Um, in 2001, 2002, I went to the Dry Valleys for just a week. This, we went, flew out November 29th. I was medevaced December 27th when they went to Beacon Valley, and they finally arrived back in New Zealand January 26th. So they actually camped out for almost two months. Um, I was there for a month, almost. So. How's your knee now? It clicks, but you know. <laughs> but it won't stop you from going back. Just money. Oh, just money. It won't stop me going back. No. Did you go because you knew about polygon shapes? Or? Yes, I knew, I went because of the polygons. Um, but also we we were interested in the polygons. But then Ron Sletton got got in touch with us. We talked with him. And it turns out there were more fundamental issues involved in the polygon formation. And we were able to be involved in that. But I got interested in the polygons because in our previous work, we were looking at contaminants. Because anywhere people go, we leave stuff behind. 
and we were looking at oil spills, fuel spills. In fact, there is a drill hole not far away from this site uh, where they used diesel as the drilling fluid because water would freeze. And they had, they had a pipe, and they assumed that the pipe would remain, you know, a nice steel pipe would maintain its integrity, but within a very short time it rusted out and diesel started spilling. So we wanted to map the extent of the diesel, and using the geophysical techniques, we can. We found a nice signal in Scott Base, and nice signal in a place called Marble Point, where they almost had a U.S. Uh, Antarctic base. But here, the polygons interfered with the signal, and so we had this overprint of the polygon signal on the signal of the contaminant. And of course, people would say, well, let's just do tests, let's just dig it out. As soon as you dig it out, disturbs the permafrost, disturbs the whole thermal cycle. And so then it changes how things move. So it's actually better to just leave the stuff where it is, figure out where it is, and then try and figure out how to get rid of it. Because as soon as you try and clean it up, you disturb the site more than it was before. So this is why when we go in now, especially the dry valleys, it's a special area. You go in and you have to have a whole environmental plan, and we did move on, we actually helped develop it. And everything that went in got brought out. Yeah? You mentioned taking a core sample. Would that how, how big is a core sample? Would that dis, uh, disturb the environment? Not like that. Small. It's not very big. It's the drilling instead, and the drilling fluid. And now there would be all kinds of environmental controls on the, on the drilling. They'd be, have to be very, very careful. But there's a company in New Zealand that now that has actually been down there a few times and specializes in that kind of thing. Yeah. You mentioned that some people think you know, the polygons are eight point one million years. In Beacon Valley, yeah. yeah. Uh, how old do you think? Yeah. I don't think they're more than a million. Um, it's it's all controversial, and there are people who've gone into Victoria Valley here and mapped what they think along these hills. They've gone around with, with all the snow melted. They've gone around and mapped what they think are an old shoreline. And they think there was an old a lake there, or maybe, you know, a glacier fill. And again, that's controversial because you look, you get the, the same forms, and two different people may interpret them in different ways. And they can justify their interpretation based on the things they've seen before. And this is the thing we have to keep in mind in science is we often go in with models, preconceived models. And so we often take our data and, and shoehorn them into those models. And this is actually another area I've worked on, is um, a colleague and I have actually uh, submitted a paper to a journal on challenging paradigms and misconceptions in geophysics. And the subtitle is Let the Data Speak. And often we don't let the data tell its story or the data can be ambiguous, and that's where we have to be careful. But nature often finds a way, finds a middle ground. Um, it sounds like something out of Jurassic Park, doesn't it? Um, but, um, I mean, look at mantle convection. What, uh, how, how many decades ago I was doing my PhD, and people thought about that mantle convection, that there were these people who thought it was a layered, upper mantle, lower mantle, and those who thought it was whole mantle convection. And they argued, I mean, they were passionately opposed. And the problem was the evidence went both ways. You could, you could find evidence for either. And now we've been able to get really fantastic seismic tomography on the Earth. And you know what? It's somewhere in between. We have, they've discovered there's something called um, what do they call it? It's a slushy subduction, where a slab goes down, it reaches that 700 kilometer discontinuity, and it melts and it drips through. So you have something like a combination of layered mantle and whole mantle convection. So the answer is, is it layered or whole? Yes. <laughs> so nature often finds a way to confound us but that's exciting. I think that's a good place to finish. <laughs>